Hello, I'm Anna Christina from the Autistic Realm Australia and I'm an autistic parent of a transgender child and so I'm here to talk about some practical advice for if you're in a similar position. So what I'm talking about is based on my own lived experience but also um, on the shared experience of the community groups that we've been running for over five years now. We have a lot of families with gender diverse children and there's been a lot of conversations and um, discussion of best ways forward and, and how to cope and, and to support your child. And so um, what I'm talking about has been worked out very, very much over the last five years. Um, now, before I start, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that the link between gender and gender diversity and autism is strong. It's valid. It's well evidenced. There's been research for over 10 years now. Um, it is what it is. It's a thing. Autistic people do gender differently. Um, we do a lot of things differently and we do that one differently as so. well. So, starting off. The very first, the most foundational thing of all is my first suggestion, my first tip, listen. Listen, don't argue with your child, discuss this one. Do not argue, dismiss, assume as a parent <laughs> that you know better. I mean, it comes with the, the parenting territory, doesn't it? We just assume because we're the grown-ups, we know more. Your child is the expert in themselves. So um, you need to listen. You also need to be aware that when a child comes to you and discusses this with you, they are doing the bravest thing they've ever, ever done. And they are terrified that you won't love them anymore because you're, you, they're not what you thought of them were. Listening is the very first thing you can um, do to show both respect and validation. They're trusting you for that. And a um, bit, of, bit of shush on your part. Can help with that. Um, as an autistic child the chances are they've done their research too. This is not a fad or a stage that they're going through. They know their own truth. So um, they probably, if they're like my son, done an absolutely deep dive and know more about gender than you ever thought was possible. Um, and to them this isn't news, it's just news to you. Um, other thing to remember while you're listening is this isn't about you. It's about your child and hearing them tell you something that is absolutely essential to them, to their um, sense of self. The next um, tip I have is you need to believe. There are people that, that do say that our children, especially autistic children, are too stupid to know what gender is and they got it wrong. <laughs> or it's an obsession and it's not really... Um, not really what's going to happen and you should ignore it or really put them straight about how it works. Um, another thing you might hear of is called um, some this made up, uh, dis, uh, made up disorder called rabbit onset gender dysphoria. Rubbish, no such thing. You might not have ever seen any signs but your child's been thinking about this for a long time. It doesn't come out of the blue. So you need to believe them. And they've trusted you enough to come to you and tell you. So they're hoping for your support, your belief, and that your love will go on. Um, this point is about for some children, young. Oh, I'm a parent with older children, some of them in their 20s now. For me, anything under 30 can be a child. So um, this could apply to anyone who is three or 23. Um, so child doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking about people in primary school. But for some people, um, in my experience, because I've only dealt with autistic, gender diverse people generally, um, it seems to be not uncommon that it's more of a journey to work towards what is the right place for them in the gender spectrum. Um, with my son, there was no doubt about it. He, he's known he was a boy from, since he was two, I think. 
Um, but others need to work through it. With autistic people, it's very common for us not to be able to um, really conceptualise some, conceptualise something until we actually do it. So for some young people, they need to work through being non-binary or um, socially transitioning from their own gender to another. Socially transitioning is only wearing different clothes, maybe a different name and using the pronouns. That's all it is. There's no harm in allowing a child to um, um, experience their identity that way. Um, but for, like I said, for some of our young people, it isn't um, an absolute rock solid knowledge. Uh, for others, they need to work through till they come to the place that is right for them. Now, two things that I want to say about that is um, some people do tra detransition. It's very, very rare. Um, not that you'd think so in the media, but it is very, very rare. Um, that doesn't mean they got it wrong, though. Oh, that's how it's presented, like it should never have happened, they should never have been allowed. Well, you don't have to think of it as right or wrong. Surely that was their truth at the time. And that's one of the things I said to my son, actually, that um, I didn't want him to feel that if he ever came to a conclusion that he needed to change his path somehow, that he was trapped and he wouldn't come to us and talk about it. Um, I just wanted him to know that wherever he went, we would go with him. Second part of this thing about detransitioning is the idea that uh, if you've transitioned, you can't come back. You know, it's the change is irrevocable. Well, you know what? It's not. If we can help a child by um, the topical things like clothing, pronouns, um, things like that, names, maybe hormone um, uh, um, uh, therapy, maybe even surgery. Who knows? That's a very long way down the track for a lot of um, um, trans people in particular. But if we can help our child be one, this we can help them do come back and be a different one. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, women have been putting breasts on and off for decades now, do hair treatments. Um, there's so many things that people can do to be who they are that really I can't see how you could get it wrong and that, you, you know, yes, there may be some challenges, but there were challenges, um, for instance, with my son. Um, he... Um, it has difficulty with what he refers to as his chest. And um, that can be dealt with. If you change his mind, it can be dealt with again. It's okay. Like I was saying, you can't get this wrong. Your child can't get this wrong either. This is them. They may change over time, but it's not about right or wrong. It's about being who they are. And if you follow their lead, you can't get this wrong either. So next topic is what I've called small things matter. By small, I'm referring to pronouns, um, different names, um, and maybe social transitioning. Now, I've said small because when my son came out to me, um, those things seem so irrelevant. It's like, you want to change, have different pronouns? Fine, go for it. You know, that's simple. We're up here worrying about them. They're living their lives. And those small things validate their identity. They actually have a huge importance. They also have a protective um, um, mechanism as well. They validate a person's identity. If those things aren't, made, and if it isn't made towards them, we're actually denying our child's um, reality. Using the pronouns they ask for, using a different name, treating them as they need to be treated is actually um, protective. It reduces the um, incidences of suicidal ideation, self-harm, uh, depression, anxiety, because every person needs to be acknowledged for who they are. Um, in fact, all these things together 
bring down the risk of those those um, mental health issues to almost close to the um, same sort of ratio in the general population in, the, in their age cohort as well. So they're not little things at all. They're actually really important. Privacy and safety. Uh, so there's some simple things that sound simple. This isn't your story to tell. You need to learn that. I found that very hard, I'll be honest. I didn't know how to tell them who didn't, where it was appropriate and where it wasn't. But this isn't your story to tell and you need to be careful. Remember, we live in a world that is not very accepting of gender diversity. In fact, there's a cultural war being fought over our children's bodies right now. If you out your child by telling them their story when it's not a safe place, you could be actually putting your child in harm's way. Um, sad to say, that's just the reality of life. I mean, it's appropriate, you know, um, it, things like school, so the school knows, the doctor knows. Um, with my son, we talked about emergencies because I don't disclose anymore <laughs> unless he tells me to. And I said to him, well, what if you were unconscious? And, you know, the ambulance is there. And I know that, you know, they may have to treat your body differently um, and they need to know. And we had a talk about that and we've come to the conclusion there are certain circumstances where I'm allowed to disclose without his permission. But safety comes first. The second part of this with the privacy is that people will ask the weirdest questions. They seem to think that um, it's sort of like being pregnant, you know, you're allowed to make judgments. Um, you can pat a woman's stomach or, or just assume she has to have orange juice instead of a glass of champagne. I don't know why people think like this, but you will have be surprised by pe questions people say, oh, is he going to have surgery? He's three. Um, oh, is he on hormones? None of your business. Um, it doesn't, it, it strikes me as absolutely weird that people need to know what's going on in someone's clothes. <laughs> Just be aware, you're going to be surprised. Um, I just say breathe and try and be polite if you can. Um, part of privacy and safety is something that's been brought up by a few members in our community. And that's true with your broader family. Not every family will accept your child as they are. And for some of you, you're going to face a very difficult decision about whether you allow these people in your child's life and your life. Some families do lose members over it. I think it's a tragedy, absolute tragedy, that it happens. Like I said, who cares about what's happening under their clothes? Um, but it's a very serious issue. You need to remember that your behaviour is communication as well as a parent. We, in Tara, we say all communication, all behaviour is communication from the child, but it goes the other way too. As a parent or a carer, your behaviour goes the same way. So if you were to take your um, your child to see their an aunt who just will not use anything but their dead name, and you do that time after time, what you're actually telling your child is that your aunt. The aunt's allowed to behave any way they want. They're more important than your child. That may not be how you understand it, but that is how your child will understand it. And um, you need to look at it from the child's worldview. Some families lose members. I think it's a tragedy. There are also children who lose their entire families. Um, I know a lot of young people through my son who lost their parents. I, I find that difficult. How could you reject your child? Which leads me to my most important point, my last one, um, unconditional love. It's sort of like a motherhood statement. Um, oh, yes, I love my child. Of course I love my child unconditionally and all children deserve unconditional love. But for most people, that's never a challenge. They've never had to think about it, so they can say that. And, and they think they mean it. But when my son was telling me who he was, I actually had these thoughts running through my head of, oh, my 
goodness, I, I have to sit here and think, do I love my child regardless? Does it change how I respond to my child? What do I do? And for me, it was, that to say something very autistic, but for me it was black and white. It's quite simple. This is my child. Um, I have to. I don't have a choice. That, that's them. It's always been them. Um, and I realised that I actually could give my child guaranteed unconditional love. But if you're not challenged on it, you don't know how confronting that is. And if you have a child that's gender diverse and comes to you, you are being challenged at that very point. It's actually a change point in your life and the life of your child. And your child is a marvel and a wonder. I hope you can offer them unconditional love. But like I said, it's confrontational and shocking, but I hope you'll think about it. Um, it's so important. Now, you can see behind me that, that purple elephant on my slides. Um, that purple elephant means a lot to me because when my son was talking to me and then stopped and wanted to know what I thought after he given me this revelation that I had really not expected and I'd had those thoughts about him regardless. I just remember looking at him and saying, you know what, you're still the same baby that they put in my arms on the day you were born. Um, that's you here, the one in my arm. You're the same person. And I said to him, look, quite seriously, right now, given the fact that I'm floundering here, if you were to tell me that you were a purple elephant, I would tell you you're my baby, my purple baby elephant. It, the rest doesn't matter. All that matters is that you're mine. That's the most important thing any child needs. And I hope if you're in this position, you'll be able to say to your child, like I did, who cares? You are you and I love you for who you are.